Okay. So we are live with Mikkel Thorup. Am I saying that right, Mikkel? Yeah, Mikkel Thorup. Yeah. Okay. So Mikkel, um, we, we were connected and, um, your whole thing, it seems to be is consulting on uh, second citizenships, passports, investments around the world and stuff. I'll let you get into that. Why don't we start with, um, the Mikkel Thorup story, what you do now and what you did before, how you, uh, got into the place you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm also from Southwestern Ontario. We were chatting before the interview. I grew up in London, Ontario. So just down the street from you guys. So what happened was when I was a child, I was diagnosed with a learning disability and the teacher pulled me out of class and they sat me down in a little room and they said, Mikkel, something doesn't work quite right in your brain. And what we want to do is send you to a special school, a uh, special school for special boys. And that's what they did every day for three years. I got on a little white bus, I took a little white bus across town and I went to this quote unquote special school. Now, the only problem, Anthony, was that it was actually not a small uh, a special school. It was actually a regular school with a special class. So you can probably imagine what happened. I got in tons of fights. I got picked on. I got bullied all around. It was a pretty crummy experience. Now, this is no woe is me. I'm a victim. Poor Mikkel, poor Mikkel. Certainly not. I got hit and I hit back. And if I could, I hit back twice as hard. Like I would never claim otherwise. I hate victim mentality on all fronts. But I went to this special school for three years and, um, after three years, I finally got to return to my neighborhood school. And on my first day of school or my first week of school, I thought, you know, everyone is going to be so excited to see me. They're going to be so happy to see me. And you can probably imagine what happened again. I show up and everybody starts gossiping and whispering. Oh, I remember Mikhail. He went to school. Thanks, guys. Very politically correct. Kids are very, very sensitive. You know how they are. But uh, it left a very bad taste in my mouth for public education. So uh, I stopped going. And then when I stopped going, I started failing. And then they put me into summer school and then I would fail that. Long story short, uh, I stopped going to school when I was 12 years old and I officially dropped out when I was 15. And not shortly after that, I started traveling and I started traveling internationally. And when I did that, I started meeting all these incredible people who were building their lives on their own terms, doing things that I never had seen in Southwestern Ontario. And I felt like I really found like my people, like these were my peeps. Um, and now today I've been traveling for almost 23 years straight. Uh, I've circumnavigated the globe over 400 times. I've visited, I think, 110 countries at last count. And I have uh, lived in nine different countries. So today I'm based in Panama and, I, and I've lived all over the world. And what I've done with my business is help people to figure out how to do the same things. I really work as a guinea pig. And I worked through it myself and I studied diligently. I, I never went back to school for any of this. As you can tell, there's no university degree for these types of things. So it's, it's really um, creating my business uh, based on my experiences and my terms, you could say. So we kind of covered a very long period of time, 30 sure, years in as, yeah. as short amount of time as possible, but happy to go in any direction you like. Well, I appreciate how concise that was. Uh, so how old were you when you actually started traveling? So I was 16, 17 years old around then. Okay. And what were your parents thinking at this time? So my parents were pretty excited for traveling. My father had traveled when he was in his early 20s and always told me that it was the best thing he ever did with his life. So the only thing I didn't understand was, okay, if it was the best thing you ever did with your life, why did you only do like one big trip? Why only once backpacking through Europe? Why didn't you go, you know, over and over and over again? And when I started traveling, I saw that he was right. He was absolutely right. Travel is the greatest thing you can do with your life. But I decided to dedicate my entire life to it, opposed to just doing one trip and then heading back to Southwestern Ontario and getting the white picket fence and et cetera. So when you say it's the best thing you can do with your life, um, Definitely, like travel is amazing for sure. Like I, I'm a huge fan of traveling. I'd, I'd love to travel more. I, I absolutely love it. When you say it's the best thing you could do with your life, what about um, like establishing like, you know, a home base and growing a family and that type of stuff? So I do have a family. Uh, I'm happily married man. I love and adore my wife. We have two gorgeous children together. However, we all travel together as a family. So mm -hmm. my daughter is 16 years old, or six years old, excuse me. She's been to 15 countries. She speaks uh, going on four languages, three languages at native level, and we're getting her her fourth language up to par now. Um, she's homeschooled. She's experienced the world. So that's just add an extra dynamic to traveling. Now, 
I am a very much a family man, but being being able to add that to the travel just makes the entire experience way richer. So were you traveling by yourself when you're 15, 16 or with your parents? So my first trip I did with my father was 16, 17 years old. I did Ireland, England, and Wales. I used to compete for Team Canada in martial arts. So that was the first big trip that I did. And then we went for a month around this area. And then I think I came back for a little bit and saved up some more cash. And then I went to Western Europe when I was 18, 19 years old. That was a solo trip. And I spent, I think, three months in Western Europe, ran out of money, and then took the ferry over to Morocco and spent two months backpacking around Morocco. Um, I even took a camel across the Sahara Desert for three days from Morocco to Algeria and back. So I was pretty crazy when I was a kid. I don't know if I would do those same type of things now with my own children, but uh, at that age, I, I was very fearless. Wow, that's cool, man. So then, so now, so it's okay. So you have your business now, you're a consulting firm and stuff. Um, but prior to that, what were you doing to earn money to be able to afford all these travels? Yeah. So I've done three main things in my life. I did when I was young, I was working whatever random jobs I could do, hospitality, working in kitchens, saving up money and traveling. Then I got really, really big into personal finance and investing. So I, um, first started with equities trading, but eventually found options trading and I traded options for seven years and really Wait. enjoyed it. You were doing Sorry, this on ahead. a full-time basis, Mikkel? Yeah, I was still working some other part-time jobs and things like that, but I was getting the majority of my income from this. But more than anything, really learning about financial markets and how capital works and how all of these things fit together. So I did that for probably about seven years. And now over the last seven years, I've had my own consulting firm, which is expat money or expatmoney.com, which is um, really helping people to move overseas and offshore dealing with the real estate and the taxation and the immigration. That base of knowledge came from the 23 years of traveling and doing this on my own. So as a hobby and then for my family and then for private clients and now as an entire business. So what's your big message to people right now um, who are looking in this industry? I feel like the pandemic um, from outside looking in has really accelerated this industry of, of people looking to set, second citizenships and passports and vacation properties around the world and stuff. Like what's the big message uh, that that you want to get out there with this type of stuff? You know, wh why are people doing this? Why, are, why did, why are, have you set your life up like this where you have all these eggs in different baskets? You know, like why, why? So uh, I was doing these things way before it was cool. I mean, <laughs> I started this stuff in the year 2000. Um, there were no resources out there when I started doing this. Uh, I had to figure it out all on my own. Why do I do it? First and foremost, because I enjoy it. I think it's very prudent to not have all your eggs in one basket. I like to diversify, but I diversify very differently than most people. So I'm not just diversifying through stocks and bonds and some real estate. I'm also diversifying through currencies, through time, through different products, through geographic uh, locations, from geopolitical risks, um, many, many, many different types of things. And I think that it's important that people do these types of things now and understand these things now, because as we've seen over the last two and a half, three years now, with lockdowns around the world and uh, decreased mobility, that those who had residencies or citizenships or a second home to go to, a lot of the rules did not apply to us. I mean, I live in Panama City and Panama City is great right now. And it was great before the pandemic, but there were lockdowns here. So me and my wife got on a plane and we went down to Brazil, to Florianopolis. And we were there for six months and there was no lockdowns. There was no nothing. It was like the pandemic didn't exist there. There's some people wearing a mask, but it was completely voluntary. And we had a nice normal life. We went for a walk on the beach every day and we were out having churrasco and eating great food. And it didn't affect me like it affected so many other people. So for my own mental health and for the mental health of my wife, I think that this was an excellent thing to do. And I think that a lot of people are going to be looking at what has happened over the last three years and went, wow, having everything just in one spot is very risky. And I need to diversify that risk. I need to spread that risk out. I don't assume that I know what's going to happen in the future or the best way about any of these things. I hedge my bet with everything. So I always am asking myself, what if I'm wrong? So I try to make the best decision I can, but what if I'm wrong? 
Then I try to look at, well, what's my second best option, my third best option? What's a completely contrarian view on these things? And I think I spend a lot of time thinking about this. I do it for my own life. I do it for my business and I do it for my private clients. And the results that we get for people are terrific. I mean, the transformation in people's lives is fantastic. You can see the stress just drop out of their shoulders and then relax and they just have a better quality of life. Even if they don't leave their home country, just being set up is often enough to make them feel a lot better. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess uh, for someone that hasn't even left the home country and they feel that much stress lifted off their shoulders, these must be people seriously concerned with political risks or the local geographic risk or just fed up with lockdowns and that type of stuff. Is, is that what you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. All of those things. And then I would add to it that on the opposite side, so you, you, you know, we can definitely look at things from the negatives. We can also look at things from the positives. So this is a great opportunity to work online. People have already been going remote. This is a great opportunity to connect with your family, as I told you with my story, with my wife and kids and traveling with them. It's a great opportunity to learn a new language and explore the world and see new places. You know, these are blessings. These are amazing things that you can do in your life. And as far as I know or anyone can convince me on planet Earth, we have one life to live. So you might as well spend it doing something that you enjoy. As long as it is honest and ethical, then absolutely go out there and live your life. If you want to travel and explore, then do it and do it now. You know, So there are a lot of people who are coming to this realization You know, when a lot of the freedoms were taken away. Like, I don't have time to waste. I can't sit around here and just wait till I'm 65 and then go cruising around the world. Like, I want to go now. Like, whatever that is for them, you know, we help them accomplish that goal. So for the majority of Canadians, uh, where, you know, the majority of this show's listeners are Canadians, um, you know, how strong is the Canadian passport and why would someone necessarily need to get a secondary or a third passport? What are the benefits of that? Sure. So a Canadian passport is an extremely strong passport. It's a yeah. really fantastic travel document. I have traveled to well over 100 countries on my Canadian passport. The reason someone might want to look at a secondary passport, well, there's many reasons and in no particular order. Um, there is a big fear that Canadians will start getting taxed on their worldwide income, even if they become non-residents, just like the United States. So in there's only two countries in the world currently who do this. One is Eritrea in Africa, which is known for blatant human rights violations, and the other is the United States. So the U.S. is taxing you based on your residency. So if you're a green card holder or you have substantial presence in the country or you're a citizen and you live there, but they also tax just on citizenship. So if you leave the U.S. and you live in Panama, where I am, you still have to pay money to the IRS. Well, a lot of people are fearful that this will also start to apply to Canadians, to Australians, to Brits, to some of these Commonwealth countries in the world. So having a second citizenship would allow you in the future to renounce your Canadian citizenship, if that was the choice for you, and pick up a citizenship that did not do this. So on a very regular basis, I have cl uh, client calls and we discuss renouncing their U.S. citizenship. What would that look like? What is the difference between an expat and a covered expatriate? Um, you know, what is the exit tax? How does this all fit together? How do we legally reduce your tax obligations? How do you still travel back to the U.S.? So we would have to think about all of these things with Canada as well. So that is one side of it. Another side is Canada has a fantastic passport, but there are still countries that you cannot enter for visa-free travel with a Canadian passport. So for example, you can't go to China, you can't go to Russia. There's still dozens of countries that you can't go to. You have to send off your passport for it. So for example, my son, he was born in Brazil. I told you we went down to Brazil for six months. My wife gave birth there while we were there. So our son has a Brazilian passport. Now with his Brazilian passport, he can go to Russia uh, when he's old enough visa-free. I can't go to Russia. I have to apply for a visa. I have to send my passport away. It's a whole big rimmer roll. But he'll have that option available to him always. And he's a Canadian citizenship. So we've stacked them now. Now we have two. So it gives more opportunity for visa-free access. You can also think, and, and I'll, I'll leave it at this point, but I could probably go on for about half a day of all the different uh, benefits and, and reasons you want to do this. Um, you can also think that if you do have to apply for a passport, you have to send it away. And it could be away for weeks. Now, if you're a very busy, uh, busy business traveler like I am, then you can't have 
no passport for a couple of weeks or a month or something like that. You need to always have a passport. What happens if your passport expires? In Canada, I've heard that it's taking weeks or possibly months to renew your passport. So you could be without a passport for two months or three months or something like that. Now, if you had a second passport in Panama or St. Keats or uh, Portugal or something like this, you've got that passport to travel on as well. So it's this ease of mobility. It's this political insurance if anything happens to your passport. And it's the, um, yeah, just the ability to have more options in front of you. And I think that's what really this all comes down to is optionality. Yeah, I can see how that would give a big sense of comfort uh, to somebody, especially. So, so let me ask you this. What's the main demographic of people that you work with? So the majority of my clients are probably 50 plus, definitely high net worth individuals. Yeah. Um, people that have like, something to lose in the countries that they're in. That's what I was just thinking, right? Correct. Correct. Absolutely. People work very hard for their money to build up their wealth. And the thought of losing it all because of um, geopolitical or government risk or currency collapse or who knows what it might be. You know, that's a really scary thought, especially... You know, if you're looking just a little bit ahead in retirement, what are you going to do? So the majority of my private clients are probably 50 plus. Um, we're very um, freedom orientated, liberty minded individuals. Um, these are the people who hire me. Now, who listens to my podcast, The Expat Money Show? Who reads my free newsletter? Who listens, uh, reads the blog at expatmoney.com? I mean, anybody and everybody. I mean, the, the resources are out there to help no matter if you are 20 years old and you're just starting on your journey or if you are a decamillionaire. I mean, all of those resources are out there and they're free with my work. But working with the private clients is the high net worth individuals because there has to be a value add. Like my fees are not cheap. Like I, just to be very frank, I'm, I'm ridiculously expensive. However, with that comes a ton of one-on-one -on -one attention and a lot of due diligence with any of the partners that we work with and the transformation in someone's life and their situation is just unbelievable. So there's very few people who have the specialized knowledge and information that I do that has been built up over 20 years. So working with me can make sense for the right people. What about young millennials? Have, have any has a large amount of young millennials reached out to you who now have the option to work remotely, but might not have any wealth build up. Like that's not their primary driver for doing this. It's more so to just have these mobility assets to travel around the world and live, you know, this, this digital nomad lifestyle with minimum yeah. barriers. Absolutely. I mean, I get, I mean, I probably have about 3 million people a year who read my work. So I get lots of inquiries from people all over the world and we try to put out really top quality information, like lots of stuff on digital nomadism. And I try to help people, um, not just the ultra wealthy. I want everybody to understand these ideas because in 20 years of traveling, I have seen this is the best path to freedom. This is the best vehicle to having more freedom in your life. I've not seen anything else better than being an expat and the offshore markets. So I want to get this information out there. And that's why we do so much free stuff. We just had a summit, actually. Uh, we had over 7,000 online attendees for the summit. It was amazing. We had Dr. Congressman Dr. Ron Paul as a speaker, my friend uh, Doug Casey, uh, Jim Rogers was a speaker, all these amazing people. But we also had a ton of names at the conference that no one has ever heard of. That's because they're the lawyers and the accountants and the real estate developers and all the professionals that I work with for my private clients. And it was free to attend. I didn't charge anything. You could come watch any of the presentation you wanted, 100% free. If you wanted to upgrade and get a VIP ticket or something, there was all those options. But I always encourage people, just check it out. Just learn about it, you know, and then see if it's for you. Yeah. Being to all these different countries, seeing all these different political regimes, um, risks around the world, different economies, what from your travels have you seen in terms of risks that Canadians might not be thinking about or where who don't travel as much as you like what are what's the average Canadian missing from the bigger picture right because you get a lot of perspective when you travel that much and see all these different systems well it's interesting like I'm a Canadian citizen but I've been gone for a very long time Canadians are really brought up to think that Canada is the best country in the world and we do everything the best. We have the best health care and the best banking system. And 
really everything we're just kind of told that we're the best. But actually, when you get out there in the world and you start visiting other countries, it's not necessarily true. And and I'm not trying to be mean or shatter anyone's bubble. Canada's a great place and it's a gorgeous country and the natural beauty is amazing. But it's a big world out there, 193 countries. Like, there's a lot of opportunity. So I think that because Canadians are told that we're the best in everything, they never really look past their borders very much, which really closes off 99% of the world and 99% of the opportunities. And if we even just look at simple things like the devaluing of the Canadian dollar over the last couple of years and what has been happening with currencies, what's been happening with precious metals, what's been happening with crypto, with, I mean, all of these types of things and real estate in all these other countries, which we haven't had a chance to really touch on, but I'm happy to dive into, yeah, um, is like, it's just a really big world out there, Anthony, <laughs> really big. So, you know, my message to Canadians is start exploring, start uh, doing your research. Don't think that uh, everything is best in your backyard because it's made in Canada. Are we being brainwashed, Mikkel? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's the common pushback I've heard um, to some of this stuff. Like, oh, why do you need second passport? Why do you need this? We have a strong passport. You know, Canada overall, despite any flaws we might have, is still one of the greatest countries in the world to live in. That's the common pushback, right? Um, but okay, so let's talk about real estate. Like, maybe it's different for Canadians specifically. Maybe you could speak to that if it is. Um, but for just people you work with in general, um, is who? Yeah, someone's waving in the background there. <laughs> Uh, just in general, where are the top places that you're recommending people to go? Now, I know it probably varies on taxes and all the jurisdictions and all this type of stuff, but for the average person, where are some of the top ranking places that you would put uh, at the top of the list? Okay. Well, we can come at this from a couple of different um, ways. Let me just quickly chime in on real estate itself and one of the thing, some of the things that we're looking at, and then I'll talk about some of the jurisdictions and why we look at them in general. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. The way that I work in real estate is I'm not just looking at the real estate itself. The majority of the times I'm using real estate as a vehicle to get someone a second residency or a passport. So this means the legal right to live and work in that country, to own the real estate, to open a business, to do banking in that, to go there and not leave. You know, you can enter the country and you don't have a 30 day or a 60 day or a 90 day tourist visa. You can build your life there. Now you can do it full time or you can just have it as a backup plan. So there's many countries in the world which will allow you in if you do a substantial investment into the country. And the majority of these substantial investments is real estate. Now, some of them have to be government approved projects, which I'm not a big fan of. However, other ones will allow you to come in and you can buy real estate anywhere. So you can buy on the secondary market, you can buy on spec, you can buy something and fix it up and flip it or rent it out on Airbnb for short-term rentals or long-term rentals, or even live in it yourself. I mean, there's just so much options here. So for example, we could look at a country like Turkey. Turkey has a citizenship by investment program. It is currently 400,000 US dollars. You buy the real estate, you go through uh, all your paperwork, your KYC, AML, know your customer anti-money laundering. So everything is legit. After seven, eight months, you actually get your citizenship and passport in hand. So a Turkish citizenship, although as not as strong as a Canadian passport, it's still visa-free travel to 111 countries, which is quite good. Now, the countries that you get access to with a Turkish citizenship are very different than the ones that you get with a Canadian passport. So they start to overlap, just like we talked about before. Now you only have to hold the real estate for a couple of years. And as I said, you could rent it out, you can make money on it. You know, it's a cash flow producing asset. And when you go to Turkey, and I highly encourage you do, you can go and stay there. I mean, we're going through this program right now. It's amazing. Istanbul is one of the best cities on planet Earth. I mean, Turkish airline flies to more cities or more countries than anywhere else. It's a huge place. There's so much culture and heritage and food. And it's just a really interesting place to spend time. And I'm a massive fan of it over there. So there's lots of opportunities like this that if you are looking at a global perspective for your real estate investment, you can basically get a residency or a passport for free. So why wouldn't you do these types of things? There's other countries where you have to make $100,000 or even a million dollar donation to the country 
to get the citizenship. But with these ones, with real estate, the passport's just throwing in afterwards. Like that's amazing. Yeah. So you get to buy the real estate, which has the benefits of owning that real estate and you get the, the pass into the country. Correct. Correct. So is that what you recommend most people do? It seems kind of obvious. Like, why would you just throw away your money with a donation when you could own a hard asset and especially something that produces cash flow? So that's a good question. So let's compare that against something like the citizenship by investment in the Caribbean. So there's five countries in the Caribbean that do CBI. You have Dominica, Granada, um, Granada, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis. These are the five countries. Now, some of them have a real estate option, but the real estate has to be a government approved project. So it's going to be a hotel chain and you're basically buying like a one bedroom uh, hotel room and maybe you get to spend a couple of days a year there and you need to hold it and the returns are going to be absolutely paltry. Or it can be a project and you get a bachelor apartment and you can rent it out. But when you go to sell it on the secondary market, that delta between what you can what you bought it for and what you can sell it for is basically the donation amount anyways. And you can't sell it to another CBI owner. So the secondary market is like horrible. You know? mm. So in these countries, you might want to just look at the donation. Say it's 100,000 US or 150,000 US. You get your passport three months it's in your hand and you're done and you don't have to think about it again. And these countries, they kind of fall between the 150 to 155 countries of visa-free travel. So this could theoretically replace your Canadian passport as a primary citizenship. You know, Canada has, I, I don't know off the exact off the my, top of my head, but it'd probably be about 176, 178, something like that visa-free travel. Same with the US. They're, they're U.S. I think is tenth best passport in the world. I think Canada comes in at sixth or seventh, somewhere around there. So, if you needed to renounce your citizenship, this would be a viable Plan A passport. Where a Turkish, you know, is a great Plan B or C or D, but I probably wouldn't want it as my primary. Um, now, there's other countries in the world where you can purchase real estate. You can. They don't have a citizenship by investment, but you purchase the real estate, you get residency, and then you live in the country for a couple of years. And after, say, three or four, three or five or seven years, then you can go through a process called naturalization, where you can apply for a citizenship afterwards. And those can be also really fantastic uh, travel documents, but you've got this time lag on it. So instead of say three months in the Caribbean or seven or eight months in Turkey, it's five years or seven years or something like that. So does that all make sense? Yeah. A uh, question for you personally, how many passports do you have, Mikhail? I don't disclose that on things like this. Okay. Uh, I have a no few problem. though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was going to ask too, um, the benefits of citizenship versus just having a passport. Okay. So good question. So there's there's four different levels here. I'll take it one step back just to be very clear. So we're going to have a tourist visa. This is you go down to Mexico and you um, you enter in, you want to go to Cancun for a week. You have a 90-day tourist visa. You don't have to apply for the visa. It's just a stamp in your passport. But at the end of it, you need to leave. Um, then from there, we can have a residency. So there's different types of residencies. There's a temporary residency. There's a student visa. There's um, a working holiday visa or a work permit. This is a certain type of residency. The step up from that is a permanent residency. So as long as you meet the minimum requirement time in the country, you can have this residency for the rest of your life. So for example, Panama has a visa here. It's called the uh, Friendly Nations visa. It will lead to a permanent residency where we have the Qualified Investor visa, which goes straight to permanent residency. You only need to visit the country one day every two years to keep your visa active. That's amazing. So this is a perfect plan B type of location. Then on top of that, you have your citizenship. So a citizenship is just like we have in Canada being born there. You know Whether that came through, you purchased it through economic means, you did through the naturalization process, you married someone from that country and got awarded that, you had um, religious rights, anything like that. You become a citizen, that's it. Like That's the maximum. Um, and with that, you get the travel document, which is a passport. The passport is just like having a driver's license, except instead of being able to go on the roads, it allows you to travel to other countries. That itself doesn't change anything else. You know, the, the citizenship is the most important thing because there has been cases where people were awarded a passport 
but they were not given citizenship. So we saw this with Nor uh, Noriega here in Panama um, many years ago. He started giving out passports, Panamanian passports, to a bunch of his friends. Then he got overthrown and taken out. And then when they went to renew their passport, they said, well, where's your citi um, citizenship, citizenship certificate? And they didn't have it. So they were not given another passport. So there should be never a case, uh, if done legally and if done correctly, that you would have a passport without a citizenship. Do you understand? Okay, got it. So to get the another passport, you need to have a citizenship, essentially. Correct. Yes, yes, Okay. Yes. So they're and like the one in the same. the difference is between a permanent residency. Well, not they're not one in the same because a citizenship is your, your actual certificate. Like I can say, I am Panamanian or I am Brazilian or I am Canadian. Mm -hmm. With the passport, that's just um, that's just your driver's license. That's just your ability to visit another country. It's not. It's just a piece of pass, uh, piece of paper. Okay. It's nothing. You know, um, for the practical sense, it matters. But when you start looking at the legal laws, it's it's not the important piece. Now, the big difference between say a residency and a citizenship is although with a residency you can live and work in a country, you can't vote, you can't participate in the um, like the democratic process, you can't uh, participate in armed services, the military, if that was your thing. Um, there's certain restrictions for these, and you don't get the passport, the travel document. But with citizenship, you get everything. So it's just like you were born in that country. Okay. Now for Canadians, um, you know, as you know, snowbirds, right? We're very attracted to warmer climates and stuff. You know, my mind goes to myself, where would I want to have my plan B destination set up? And it's definitely somewhere warm. So sure. when it comes to uh, the Caribbean um, or South America, you know, places like Panama and stuff, where are the top destinations um, that could work for Canadians based on, there's so many different factors I know, but just overall. Definitely. And this actually is is a good follow-up question because it kind of touches on what we didn't talk about in the last question. So what is very popular is a lot of the countries in Central America right now because the cost of living is very low and the standard of living can be very, very high. What is also really nice about these countries is they follow what's called a territorial tax system. So that means if the money is not made inside the country, it's an online business, you're a coach or a consultant or an Amazon FBA, or you have a real estate portfolio, rental incomes, or you sell it in capital gains or anything like this, then you're not taxed on it inside the country. So for example, you could live here in Panama full time. You could run an online business and you would not be taxed here in Panama as long as your clients are not Panamanian. And well, that's basically it. As long as it's not a business inside Panama, even though you reside here, the business is not here in Panama. So or like a rental property portfolio in Canada. Correct. Correct. So you would not be taxed on that in Panama. Now, if you opened a bar here or you were a barber and you cut hair or something like that in Panama, absolutely, there's tax here. It's not a tax-free country. However, the tax system they follow will not tax you for our types of businesses or investments or anything like that. So you can think of uh, Panama, where I live, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Belize, all of these countries follow this type of tax system. They're all very warm weather climate countries. They're huge tourist destinations. There's a lot to do. There's big expat communities. There's organic food, uh, fruits and vegetables. There's amazing seafood and fish. Um, the medical facilities in a lot of these countries is top notch. For example, I'm 10 minutes away from a Johns Hopkins hospital, um, you know, a world-class hospital here in Panama with fantastic doctors, which were trained in the United States or the UK or in Germany and things like this. So really great medical professionals, and a lot of them speak English as well. So you never have any worry about that. And then when you start getting rid of the taxation and the rent is a lot lower and all of these things, can really have a fantastic standard of living um, down in, in the Caribbean or in Central America. So general affordability wise, it's it's a cheaper way to live down there? Yeah. I mean, you can have a, a very cheap life or you can have a very expensive life. Like sure. I would not say that my life in Panama is cheap by any means. I've got, um, my wife is a homemaker. We My mother lives with us full time to help care for our kids. I have two children. We have a full-time nanny. We've got a maid. We've got a 4,700 square foot penthouse apartment. I mean, it's not cheap here for me. However, the quality of living and the the 
um, ability to do what I want here in Panama is fantastic. I mean, we're 15, 20 minutes away from Tucumán Airport. We go away almost every single month on vacation or work travel or something like that. And it's like the flights and the time to get to any of the neighboring countries is really, really short. Like I can go to Colombia in 60 minutes. I We went to Aruba at the beginning of the year. It's like two and a half hours or something like that. So we can pop over to Aruba for a week. You know, you can't do that in Canada. Canada's pretty far away from most places in the world. Like, okay, people go down to Dominican Republic or Cuba or something like that, but that's kind of the extent. Panama's a lot more centrally located and can go a lot more places in a lot better time frame. So you can have a very cheap life here, you know, a thousand bucks or a couple thousand bucks, um, you know, if you're solo or if you're retired or something like that. But if you want to spend, I don't know, several hundred thousand dollars a year and go out for nice dinners and live the big life, then it's also available here. So, and, and everything sure. in between. But apples to apples, I mean, like, you know, your 4,700 square foot penthouse apartment in Toronto or it would be a multi, multi million dollar. Yes. I mean, it's a nice place here, but if it, it's so your money goes a lot further down there. Definitely, definitely. Now, are these countries dollarized? What, what are the main currencies in, in most of these Caribbean countries? So the majority of them will have their own currency. In Panama, it is a US dollar economy, which has been great for us as the US dollar has been surging and most other currencies have been dropping. And when you compare it to uh, Venezuela or Argentina or Colombia or the Hiai in Brazil, then I mean, if we're, we're very grateful to be a US dollar economy. Do I love the US dollar? No, I don't, absolutely not. I don't like any fiat currencies. I'm very much precious metals. Uh, Bitcoin, tangible assets, agricultural land, real estate, things I can touch and smell and see and these types of things. I don't like the Federal Reserve or printing money out of nothing. Uh, I'm very much against this. But compared to some of the neighboring countries, I am grateful to be in US dollar. Yeah, we're on board with all that, man. Um, now let's talk about that, like your investing strategy as um, I guess you would consider yourself an expat, digital nomad. You know the high net worth clients you're working with. I know with your consulting firm, you also do, I think, some investment consulting in addition yeah, to the passports and site. Yeah, definitely, right? That's like a main thing. Yeah. So, And just to be clear, uh, I'm not a licensed broker to be able to give financial advice, but what I am able to do is make introductions to licensed professionals who sign off on everything. And they, um, you know, these are relationships that I've built up over the years. Same thing as I am not a lawyer, I'm not a tax accountant, uh, anything like that. Uh, I work with people and I work side by side with all of the lawyers to make sure that we always stay compliant and legal every step of the way. Okay, sure. Um, but I'm just wondering, so you're hedging your geopolitical risk and stuff with the with the set with the citizenships and passports. Now, how are you hedging your financial risk? So good question. So what I do and what I do for a lot of my clients is we are looking at different types of currencies. So if I'm looking at different types of real estate, how is that real estate going to be paid out? Is it going to be paid out in US dollars, in euros, in Great British pounds, in something completely different like a Turkish lira? You know, Turkish lira has been massively inflated over the the last couple of years. You know, I don't want to get paid in Turkish lira. So although I have a Turkish lira bank account, I also have a US dollar bank account in Turkey. So when rental income comes in, I can take that in US dollars. And from there, I could put it in a brokerage account. I can buy more precious metals. I can buy more real estate with it or just keep it in Turkey. And when we travel there, I can use it for my expenses to live. So the vacation is almost free or our time in the country is almost free. Um, I'm looking at a lot of the Asian stocks right now. I just had Mark Faber on my podcast today as we're recording this. And we talked all about the Hong Kong stocks and what are happening over there and how it's such a depressed market. Um, you know, incredibly intelligent PhD in economics from Switzerland who has been investing for the last 50 years, um, billionaire investor. So that was a great episode to get his perspective on what is happening in Asia and how we can buy Asian currencies and Asian investments and equities on the cheap over there. Um, you know, we're buying real estate in Brazil right now. I think that the the Hiai is 
about as low as it could possibly go right now. So we're looking at the geo arbitrage by taking US dollars, moving it down to Brazil, which is one of the BRICS countries, which is a completely different market, which has really shown itself to be freedom oriented over the last few years. Buying quality real estate there and then sitting on it, you know, this will be a permanent fixture in my portfolio. Am I going to make a million dollars on it tomorrow? No, absolutely not. But if it rebounds and does what I expect it to do and more divisiveness in the world and more walls going up, then I'll be very happy to have a home in Brazil and generating income in the local currency there. I know that Brazil has just gone very left-leaning with Lula being elected and a lot of uh, problems there with the election, but that still doesn't change the fact that I think that Brazil is a fantastic place to spend time and to start acquiring assets. How are you identifying these different real estate opportunities? I know you're a big traveler. Are you traveling to places to scope all this stuff out? Are you following, you're obviously following the political headlines and stuff, which I don't envy because you must be following all this just crap going on in all corners of the globe. Um, so how are you identifying these opportunities? I travel literally every single month to go and look at different properties, different investments, uh, strengthening relationships with professionals I already have with local lawyers. Or if I don't have a relationship in a country that I think is up and coming, then I always spend my own money first to go and check it out and build those relationships before I ever talk about it on the podcast or the newsletter or the blog or any of these types of things. So I like to do it myself. I'm not an armchair traveler. I'm not an armchair investor by any means. Um, I, I do my own research on these things. I, I have full-time researchers who work for me. I mean, my business is not just me. I've got uh, 17 staff right now, 17 full-time staff. So I have full-time researchers who do a lot of the grunt work for me, but um, the final decision is always mine. I'm always out there uh, checking it out myself. Yeah, and you're also plugged into this expat network with uh, fingers all over the globe, right? That can kind of give you a heads up on this type of stuff too, right? Yeah, definitely. I'm on a, a private investors group, for example. We meet every single Monday. Um, yeah. I brought up the topic of Armenia because I think that this is going to be a fantastic destination. They're going to be releasing a, well, hopefully they'll be releasing a citizenship by investment. We'll find out, I think it's January 19th, January 19th or January 29th. I can't remember off the top of my head on resolution. And if it is, then it's $150,000. You can get your citizenship there and they're plugged in because they have access to SWIFT, but they also have access to the banking sectors for Russia and massive um, cultural blocks. You know, I want to have assets on the other side of that. So I started talking to all of my my friends on this call and a bunch of them have been there and spent time there and own real estate. And so, you know, being able to discuss this idea with other really smart peers, colleagues in this is fantastic. Now in 2023, I will be planning a trip out there. I want to go and see for myself. I will already have some connections based on the relationships I have with these other investors. They can make introductions. So I'm not going into these countries cold. You know, there's already uh, a certain amount of lag work because I have spent the last 23 years doing this and forming relationships. Okay. So I know we have to wrap up soon here. I wanted to ask you about investing in timber because I saw that on your website and that's a pretty unique thing I've never learned about. So what's with investing in timber? Yeah, so I've been investing in timber for a number of years, um, looking at it in many, many different countries. Uh, I took a group of investors down to Uruguay a uh, couple of months ago now. Uh, we took down 20 people, uh, all private clients of mine. This was not just the general public. These are all private clients. And we spent a week in Uruguay, and we did conference material in the morning and field trips in the afternoon. And one of the big things that we were looking at is timber plantations there. So I really like timber for the legacy type of play. You own the land yourself. You put it in your portfolio, you know, in a trust or in a foundation or even a corporation. And it can pay out in your lifetime, depending on how old you are. But it's also for your kids, for your great, for your grandkids and for your great grandkids. So it's this generational wealth transfer. So specifically in Uruguay, what they're doing is they have two different types of timber, two main types of timber, I should say. So they have eucalyptus and they have pine. I think it's about 70, 75% eucalyptus and the remainder is pine. 
All of this goes into pulp for the paper mills, and they produce a massive amount of paper for the world. I'm going to make up the number, but it's something like 15% or 20% of the world's paper comes from Uruguay. They have ports there. They're building more paper mills, and it's just an amazing opportunity there. Now, the growth cycle for these is about seven to eight years, but even if it's a down year or the price per board feet or how much pulp you're going to get is low that year, then you just don't harvest that year. The trees keep growing. It doesn't matter about COVID. It doesn't matter about 2008 financial crisis or real estate prices or currency collapse that we're going to be going through now. I mean, none of this matters. It's a safe, simple asset that will be there forever. You know, like, I mean, yeah. I don't think that we'll see any time frame where trees and timber will not be important to us. So going in and making a sizable investment there with the long time frame in mind, I think is really, really smart. So uh, the appeal is it's a hard asset. It's outside of the financial system. Correct. You have yeah. full control over it. You can manage it yourself. You can rent it out. You can uh, decide your harvest cycles. There's just so much um, freedom with these types of things. Now, the return on investment, I mean, I'm not giving financial advice, but traditionally what they've seen is anywhere from 8 to 11% on an IRR basis. So, you know, a pretty decent return, you could say. Um, we'll see what happens in the future if these types of returns continue. Maybe they increase, maybe they go down. I have no idea. But for certain people, timber investments do make a lot of sense. Yeah. Interesting. That's cool, man. So I know we have to wrap soon. Um, where can people learn more about yourself, about what you're doing and about this whole industry, just this mindset of diversifying yourself around the world? Where can people go? Sure. So if you guys go to expatmoney.com, uh, that's our website, expatmoney.com, you'll find a ton of free resources there. We're putting out new blog articles almost every single day. We have monthly webinars, also free we put out a weekly podcast that comes out every single Wednesday. So actually, even you know today, wherever you're listening to our conversation, Anthony, uh, you can go to um, to your podcasting app and type in uh, Expat Money Show. We've been doing our podcast for six years, seven years, something like that. So hundreds of episodes, a big backlog of content to go back through, um, really detailed masterclasses on all the things that we've talked about today and a thousand and one things that we didn't have a chance to to cover today. But I guess the main central place is to go to expatmoney.com. And from there, you'll find the rest of my work. And very happy to to help take care of your audience. Yeah, I really appreciate you, com you uh, coming on. I wanted to squeeze one more thing in here. Um, Tell me. The crime and safety aspect of it. Uh, how realistic is it? Is there resources like websites online where you can go to actually get an idea of the crime and security um, in, in different countries and stuff? Just how do you feel about that? Is it overblown? So it depends on where you're going. There's going to be safe jurisdictions or safe areas or cities in any country that you go to, and there's going to be unsafe places. So for example, the U.S., you know, has some of the most unsafe places in the world. I wouldn't want to be in certain neighborhoods at two o'clock in the morning. Um, and the exact same here in Panama or in Costa Rica. But it's about being smart, you know, let people know where you're going. Don't go out and get completely wasted and wander around the street. Don't flash a lot of gold jewelry and the brand new iPhone 14 or whatever model is out there right now. You know, just be smart about these things. But I would be smart about that in Toronto. I would be smart about that in New York. Like, that's not a specifically Latin America or the rest of the world type of thing. Now, as for websites, yeah, there are websites that you can go and look at. Traditionally, people, when they're looking at statistics, will look at the murder rate per 100,000. So you can, you can figure out, okay, this country has a murder rate of 21 per 100,000, or this one has 45 per 100,000, or something like that. I mean, it doesn't tell the whole story, like even close, because usually these types of statistics will happen from people that already know each other it can be domestic dis um, disturbances, or it can be related to drug trafficking or, you know, narcotracante type of things. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is what's going to be affecting expats. Usually with expats, we are well protected. Like, we're bringing tons of foreign direct investment into these countries. The police know this. The local people know the local police know this. So it's, you know, 
the expats are protected. And if you do something bad against an expat, the repercussions are going to be 10 times worse than if you did to one of the other locals. I, it's just a truth. I mean, like it or hate it, or you think that it's unfair or whatever, um, it doesn't stop it from being a truth. But I've been traveling for 23 years. I have never had a problem. I mean, I actually, I can very, very quickly tell you uh, two quick stories. So in 23 years of traveling in 110 countries, the only time I ever felt unsafe was when I was in the south of France and I was going for a walk and I started getting followed by a couple of French punks, punks with their dogs. And I could see that they were following me and I hid out in a McDonald's and I sat in there for like an hour and they got bored and walked away. That was it. And the only time I was ever robbed was in Canada. That was when <laughs> I went to, like, I went to the pool and someone broke the lock off my locker and took my wallet. That's it. I have never been robbed. I've never been mugged. I've never been had a violent thing happen to me. I've never been beat up or anything overseas. And I mean, I haven't been going for tra like all inclusive resorts and stuff. I mean, I've traveled to North Korea, Iran. I've drove across Africa multiple times. You know, Zimbabwe and Botswana. Um, I was in El Salvador uh, 20 years ago when it was just coming off of civil war. Um, you know, I've traveled to almost all countries in Latin America and Southeast Asia. I mean, I've, I've traveled a lot and many times to many countries and I've never had a problem. So by and large, what I'm trying to say is that the world is a very safe place. Yes, you have to show respect to everywhere you're going and keep a good head about you. Don't do stupid things. But that's the same advice as I would give you in Toronto or any other city in North America. Yeah, I'm laughing because I'm not as big of a traveler as you by any means. But the two times I've been robbed were in Canada too, and one time was at Knife Point, and it was it was in Brampton. So that's scary. Wow, it, that's it was scary. scary. Yeah, I was a teenager. It was pretty scary for sure. Um, but uh, and I barely traveled, but it was in it was in Canada too. Um, cool, man. Thank you well, so you come much. Come on down here to Panama. It's nice and safe, beautiful, and very, very hot weather. We'd love to see you down here. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, man. It, the way you set up your life is is very cool. It's very interesting. And it's, it's cool that you're helping others do the same now. So keep it up, man. I'm a fan. Thank you so much. Very, very kind. And thank you so much for having me on the program. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, Your Life, Your Terms.